Pastor Nick Peñaranda from First Lutheran Church of the Trinity, and we are so glad that you could join us this morning for worship. Uh, it's going to work a little differently than normal as we don't have bulletins to offer and nothing is pre-written um, that we can offer to you beforehand. So we invite you to just follow along where you can and, you know, nod your head and amen on the comfort of your own couch. So with that, we're going to begin with our confession. The confession can be found in this red book, um, page 94. If you have one of these red book, I'm going to ask for you to return it back to your congregation because I highly doubt you bought it yourself, but it's okay. We're going to use it today. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By the grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Now you're probably wondering why we would do a confession that we couldn't do together um, on a virtual worship, but we always begin with the confession at worship because it's important for us to start with um, honest and clean hearts, minds, and souls as we get together to worship God, right? Because we believe that God knows all, and um, we truly do believe in a um, universal communion together. So um, now that we've completed that, if you feel called, you can uh, play this back and recite it as well, or try to memorize this confession that we use every single Sunday, or uh, we can continue on. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son came into the world to free us all from sin and death. Breathe upon us the power of your Spirit, 
that we may be raised to new life in Christ and serve you in righteousness on all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue with the readings. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and sent me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is a reading from Romans 8, 6 through 11. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And if Christ is in you, through the body, through the body is dead because of sin. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Christ from the dead, will give you life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. The Holy Gospel today comes from John, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, him who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. 
rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after, he, the, he, after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you and you're going to go there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was referring to mere sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus has already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again, that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, you will see... Mm -mm. I messed up a few pieces. We're going to go back a little bit, just so you know. I'm so sorry. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask for him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up and go quickly out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been there for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you were always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. 
When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his faith wrapped in cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the season of quarantine, the third Sunday, we are doing a prayers of intercession, which are quite typical. But as I mentioned last week, that I'm going to be requesting prayers from all of you. And y'all all did deliver. And so on Wednesday, we received a number of prayer requests. And we prayed on Wednesday. But we are also going to lift these up again. So Lord, we come before you with prayer for the church, the world, and all of its creation. Host of provision, you set the table for all to feast, whether we are starving or already fed. Your gift of everlasting life comes in abundance in a world where hoarding resources keeps many lacking. We lift up to you those who are lacking in employment, poor folks who have lost their jobs, experiencing layoffs, and for undocumented immigrants unable to file for unemployment after also losing their jobs. May these people and their families be taken care of and opportunities arrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healer of the wounded, we confess that we are not well. Take our sick and suffering world and remove our illnesses. Lay healing hands over the families who have lost loved ones to COVID-19. Save the world from this virus and may it be gone for good. As we wait for the day of change and transformation, we ask you to look over the people of Italy and anywhere else that is struggling with the growing number of COVID cases. Look over people like Prince Charles and friends of Miss V. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Walk with your children, dear Lord, even as breathing is becoming dangerous. We give thanks for our doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers. Protect people still working and serving the public, such as sanitation workers, mail carriers, grocery clerks, liquor store assistants, gas station attendants, cooks, clergy, delivery drivers, and other essential employees. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful judge, you oversee all on earth. Have favor towards our beloveds, Edward, Diana's brother-in-law, and Charlie Foster, child of Dr. Foster. May the folks taking care of them be filled with your love and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guiding presence, walk with those both victim and perpetrators in the cycle of violence. We ask you to be with the people dealing with high crime, the homeless, and the vulnerable folks in the hospital system, as well as our jails for our Cook County inmates. Be a fence of peace and protection, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. At this point, I do offer, if there's anything else that the people of God want to pray for, feel free to send a message to welcome at firsttrinitychicago.com or leave a note on our Facebook page, First Trinity Chicago. But hear us now, O wondrous God, as we lift up these prayers to you. We deliver them to your feet and hand over the power to you. For it is you, Lord, mighty and righteous, who will do what is worthy and true. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen. We're really fortunate today, as mentioned, we are doing this Lenten uh, pulpit swap with Water in the Wilderness. And so our guest preacher today is uh, seminarian Adam Dowd, who is a vicar at Holy Family Lutheran Church in Cabrini Green. So feel free to either stay tuned here or there will also be another audio recording available elsewhere which will be put up as soon as possible. Grace and peace are yours from the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. How many here have heard the Lazarus story before? We're all, okay, great, like most of us, almost all of us, we're all very familiar with the story of Lazarus. We know his name. We know that Jesus rose him from the dead, that Jesus wept over him. 
And the story is really interesting because Mary and Martha are dealing with the illness. They're very concerned and they're, they're worried. Jesus is far away and they send a message to him, uh, reaching out for a lifeline, saying, Jesus, please come. It's serious. I need you here now. And Jesus doesn't go right away. He waits a few more days. And when he goes, Martha goes to meet him and says, I know if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And likewise, Mary says the same thing. And Jesus ends up going to the tomb with everybody, all those people who had come and gathered around to console these, this family in this very difficult time. They had gathered to be with them, to mourn with them, to be a community for these people. And Jesus mourns also. He weeps for Lazarus. They say, the one whom you loved has died. So Lazarus' story has a really big um, place in my heart. I have kind of my own Lazarus story. Some of you may not know this story, but I'm going to tell it today. Um, It might be kind of triggering, especially in these times. So if at any point it's like, this is just getting too real. Please make space for yourself to like walk out, take a breath or anything like that. But in 2011, while I was still in the army, I went to visit Sierra Leone to meet my daughters for the first time. And part of going to Sierra Leone or going to a foreign country when you're in the military is making sure you do all the right things. They have very long li- li- like lists of things that you know checkpoints and whatever and you have to see all these doctors and uh, tropical disease people to make sure that you have the immunizations you have your pills that you know to wear a mosquito net to cover you so that you don't get malaria and so I got my vaccinations I took my medicine every day and I slept under a mosquito net every night and doing all the right things exactly like I was supposed to I still got malaria. When I came, it was exactly 10 days after I had gotten home, which is exactly the incubation period of malaria. And Elle had seen malaria before. She had traveled to Sierra Leone uh, several times before this, and she had seen kids at the orphanage who had malaria. She'd even had it one time herself. And in Sierra Leone, it's very easy to get the medicine that you need. It's just a trip to the drugstore. It costs about six bucks to to take the regiment because it's so common there. And even though it's so common, people still die from it in Sierra Leone. Don't let me downplay malaria. It's one of the biggest killers in the world. But when I had been back to the United States in a place where nobody has seen malaria in like 70 years, and I was taken to a small desert hospital of Barstow, California, which is, Barstow is just a pit stop on the way from Las Vegas to Los Angeles. They never, they, they asked, how do you even get malaria? As my spouse was like, this is malaria. I've seen it, I know what it is. He's spiking a fever. Of course, this is what he has. But they said, ah, oh, we gotta take your blood. We have to send your, your results down the hill, which meant down to the UCLA to get them tested by a tropical disease center, someplace that had the facilities to test for it. And so it was gonna take two days to get our results. So they gave me Tylenol and sent me home. Said your fever of 104 is whatever. There's nothing else we can do for you. And uh, one of the things about malaria is you get fever at night and then you kind of get better during the day and then you get a fever at night again. And so sure enough, the next day, I started to spike a fever, 104.5 this time, even higher. Thinking, this is ridiculous, we can't go back to this hospital. We knew, surely, if we go to the military installation, they have people traveling international all the time, they will have the medicine that we need, they will be able to run the test and get me the help I need. So we drive 45 minutes into the middle of the desert where Fort Irwin is located, went to the hospital and I said, sorry, We don't have any testing capabilities for that here. We could take your blood, but at this point, you'll get your results just as fast from Barstow as you would from us. And so they gave me Tylenol and sent me home. Third day comes around. Fever is getting very bad. 
I go back into Barso Hospital, you know, being like, please, uh, do you have the results? Can I please get some medicine? And I said, yes, we've gotten your results. You do have malaria, but the medicine's all the way down in UCLA and it won't be here for another two days. So I got very sick very quickly. Uh, my lung capacity, I got a respiratory infection and my lung capacity dropped so much so that I was no longer able to leave the hospital. I had to be admitted. I remember being very scared. I remember looking to Elle and saying, call my parents. I need to say goodbye. I'm not one who reaches out for help very much. So for me to reach out and say, call my parents, get them here. My parents are not super financially set, so that would be a, a burden for them to come. And I knew I'd put this burden on them because I needed them there. Just like Martha and Mary called for Jesus and said, I need you to come. I need you to be here. So I'll call them. And sure enough, her family and my family as well came. My brother drove up from San Diego where he was living. And I, they put me on a medicine called propofol. You may remember propofol from Michael Jackson. It actually was what ended up killing him. Part of propofol is to erase your memories so that you don't remember the pain in the, the difficult times that you go through. And so this next section that I'm going to tell you is not really my own recollection. It's what I've been told. I was told that I slipped into a coma. Um, that I had been intubated and had been put on full life support. They were sucking uh, fluid out of my lungs that I could no longer cough to get out. Um, I had, was on the maximum amount of oxygen they could give somebody, so much so that they were worried that they were going to burst my lungs because they were forcing so much oxygen into my lungs. And as Elle continued to fight with her health, with my insurance, to get me moved to a hospital that could better care for me and continued to fight to get help but over and over again. She's struggling to do everything she can. She's getting desperate. My uh, battalion commander showed up and she threw her arms around him and said, you have to do something. If you don't, Adam's going to die. And very quickly, he picked up the phone and called the general of the post. And the general, like this is like a, you don't just call the general. Uh, he, the general picks up the phone and calls another general, an Air Force general in Nevada, at, and says, I need a helicopter right now. I need you to, to come pick up my soldier and take them to Balboa Medical Hospital in San Diego. And so as life lighted, uh, I was supposed to be able to ride in the helicopter with me, but because I was on so much oxygen... All the extra space in the helicopter has taken up by the extra oxygen that they were feeding me or pushing, you know, into my, my lungs. Um, I drove with my family and her family down to San Diego. And it wasn't like, oh, everything's great now that I'm in San Diego. The doctors actually greeted her and said, it's touch and go. It's a coin flip. He's circling the drain. A lot of his organs are shutting down. We, we'll see, we'll day to day. And uh, I got better and then I got worse and I started getting better again. And, the, you know, they said if I had gotten there like just a few hours later, I would have been toast for sure. Abs there would have been, it wouldn't have been a question. And so Elle started thinking about how is she going to spend my life insurance? You know, we had been with our kids in Africa, right? <laughs> she, I mean... In this, in this sort of like, well, this is over. I now can't adopt my kids because I don't have a husband. And so I'm just going to take this money and go live in Africa, I guess. This is going to be my life. I'm going to be a widow after one year at 22 years old, living in Africa, uh, living in Sierra Leone with my two kids. And that's, that's now my life. And so she started to uh, going to these impossible places, um, these very difficult things to start thinking about. I can remember when my memory picks back up is when they took me off of propofol and they were telling me to cough. And I couldn't think why would I be told to cough, but like a good soldier, I obeyed. 
And so I started coughing, and then it burned really bad because they were moving the intubation tube from, my lo- from down my throat, and that really hurts. And then shortly after that, they pulled the feeding tube out of my nose. They began to take the IVs out of my arms. Not just one, there's multiple IVs in both arms, and even one into an artery in my neck so they could get medicine in super fast as they needed to. They had to remove the cuffs from my legs that had been inflating to move, circulate the blood around my body so that I wouldn't get bud sores. In one day, I went from being totally reliant on machines and doctors to keep me alive to being on my own uh, faculties, on my own abilities. I was resurrected from the state that I had been in. Now, it took me a while to be able to walk. Lazarus had only been out for four days, and I was out for 14. So, you know, when I bounced back three months later, uh, I was thinking about the fact that I had to deal with, uh, uh, no expense had been spared in my care. Hundreds of thousands of dollars had been, had been spent to keep me alive. And meanwhile, kids in Africa in Sierra Leone particularly, can't afford the $6 they need to get a malaria treatment and die because of that. One of the first nights I was back in conscious, I remember waking my mother-in-law, Dale, or small granny, if you probably know her, crying and saying, Granny, why do these imbalances in the world exist? Why am I receiving this care and our kids don't? It doesn't seem fair. I had survivor's guilt. I wonder if Lazarus had survivor's guilt. Bible doesn't say. Actually, we don't know that much about Lazarus. Despite everybody knowing that story, there's not really much that else written about him. In fact, the first time we hear about Lazarus is in John 11, when he's ill and dying. There's a presumption that Jesus had an acquaintance with this family and knew them pretty well, but he didn't really show up anywhere else. The biblical authors didn't really think anything he did was worthwhile writing down. And he doesn't show up in any other Gospels either. I mean, there's a mention of a man named Lazarus in Luke, the rich man and the poor man Lazarus. And in that story, the man Lazarus dies as well. So just as soon as Lazarus shows up in the book of John, the very next chapter, chapter 12, he disappears again. The last mention of Lazarus in John is that the chief priests were plotting to kill him because of what Jesus had done for him. Now, just here's an aside. If you ever think about the logic of somebody who's trying to kill somebody who's been resurrected, it's just wild. Because if I'm Lazarus, I'm like, come at me, bro. What are you going to do to me? I've been to the grave already, and I know the one who's going to let me out. (laughs) What do you even say to Lazarus to threaten him at this point? (laughs) Two things I want you to notice about Lazarus. He was dead and buried. He wasn't doing anything. And yet, Jesus loved him. He didn't do anything to earn that love. Nothing was written in the Bible about it. It just said Jesus loved him regardless. And the most important thing about Lazarus in in his story is that he dies. I mean, the priests are, and, and even when he does get resurrected, the priests plot to kill him again. So it's, it's all about his death, right? And, and it's very wild that this story comes to us in Lent. Lent is a time when we talk about taking on practices and doing something or not doing something. You know, using the, the purpose of this, of our Lenten practices being that we can attempt to focus more intently on Jesus, draw ourselves closer to God. But the thing is, Lazarus couldn't do anything. He had nothing left to give up. There's nothing that he could take on. 
His Lenten discipline is resurrection, is surrendering to his state. When Lazarus is dead in the grave, that's when God comes to him. What I'm trying to get at is that God comes to us when we're dead, dead in sin, when our lives are in our most dust-like state, is when God weeps over us. God comes to the tombs that we have hewn out for ourselves and calls us out. As we lie in the valley, God breathes breathes spirit into us. God causes our bones to get up and praise God for God's glory. In the waters of our baptismal death, we are pulled up. And just like God, Lazarus, it's not of our own doing, it's of God. There's nothing we can do to change our condition. This whole story about Lazarus, and Laz- Lazarus doesn't do anything. It's Jesus who calls him from the tomb. It's God who raises him from the dead. It's Christ who brings life. Christ who is working and doing, resurrecting, creating something that's worth writing down, worth remembering, worth your whole life being turned around, upside down, inside out over. And God does it all for Lazarus. He does it all for us too. Amen. The most important thing about anyone is the grace that God has shown us. God has redeemed us and called us by name and all else pales in comparison. Maybe that's why there's nothing else written about Lazarus, because what else can you say? What tops that story? When your life has become entirely centered on God and what God is doing for you, how do you beat that? Here's the thing. Jesus does things in his own timing. And in Lazarus' case, he doesn't go to him immediately. Jesus waits. And not everyone comes back in four or 14 days. We don't always understand, and frequently it's difficult to believe. Jesus tells, or sorry, excuse me, Martha tells Jesus, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus says, says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She answers him, yes, Lord. And yet, when they come to the tomb and Jesus tells her to roll it away, she doesn't know why. She struggles to believe in that moment because her brother is dead According to Jewish practices, she probably buried him herself. She probably wrapped his hands, his feet, and put the cloth over his face and laid him in the tomb herself. No wonder she doubts. The good news is that despite our doubts and unsureness about Jesus' timing, Jesus still resurrects. He doesn't tell Martha, well, if you only believed a little bit more, then your brother would be alive. No, what Jesus does is he weeps. He grieves for Lazarus. When we die, Jesus dies with us. He loves us regardless of what we have done, are doing, and have yet to do. Our baptismal promises remind us that our story isn't dependent on us, We die with Christ and we are raised with Christ in Christ's time. We know that Jesus who calls us in spirit is going to call us by name in body one day too. Therefore, let us act courageously in the world, free from all threats, knowing that our lives tell the story of the grace of Jesus Christ. The Christ who is the strength in our weakness, the power in our powerlessness, and the breath that gives our dust life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And typically I would say, and also with you, and I'm going to receive it as so.
Of course, we can't share a word of peace in person, but I do invite you to take this time to share some peace with your neighbors on Facebook. Leave them a comment, people that you haven't seen in a while, your family, your friends. Just let them know that God's peace is with them at all times. And as you're doing that, feel free to move on over to www.firsttrinitychicago.com. And right here on our main page, you'll see a huge button that says Donate. And if you feel so called, we invite you to consider donating to First Lutheran Church of the Trinity. Although our services are pretty much shut down right now, we still have different things operating. We still have ministries that we're trying to make sure can be running when we are back into um, existence again, it feels like. And so even though the building is closed, the church is still going and still moving. So any sort of donations would really be helpful at this point. Thank you so much. this Sunday, I do want to leave us all with a blessing. <clears throat> the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. Amen. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, love and serve the poor and do justice in the world. And typically we would all say, thanks be to God.
Thank you so much for coming and stopping by to have a online worship with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we also appreciate any sort of feedback, other ways that we can make this more accessible or other things that you might feel that we're missing right now that would allow for a better online worship experience. Feel free to let us know. We really appreciate it. And all of y'all have a wonderful and safe day. We'll see you next week.